We're in a political climate now in Britain which is dominated by the prospect of the coming general election which must take place by, I think it's May next year, and May, given how uh, rocky the Tory government is, the accelerating process of dis disintegration that we see unfolding in, in Westminster may take place considerably earlier than that. Every measure now taken by the Tory government and all the policies announced by the Labour opposition are fr framed essentially with its impact on the, um, on the coming election at the, at the focus of what they do. And so we have all this business, the affair last week of Labour releasing amid huge media fanfare their road to the manifesto. It's a bit bizarre. Has anyone got a copy of the road to the manifesto? It's impossible to physically to obtain. I mean, it's, you know, a case of something where the, um, the, the, uh, the media hoopla uh, surrounding the launch is much more important than the actual content of the document. You have the Tories' ham-fisted attempt to counter it with the road to ruin and so, so on and so forth. And this is what it's going to be like until, until the election takes, takes place. Um, and of course, in, in one sense, uh, even by the general standards of elections in bourgeois society, it's going to be a particularly banal affair because um, it's, a, you know, it's such a weak and pathetic government on the one hand, and on the other hand, Tony Blair has taken Labour so massively to the right that the distance between the two sides, certainly in terms of their formal policies, is very narrow indeed. Now, this might well then seem like a situation in which revolutionary socialists have absolutely nothing to say. You know, in other words, we should s essentially take a rest for the next 12 months, go to sleep, you know, brief r rip Van Winkle period in which we go to sleep, we hibernate until the election is over and then we can return and have things to say. Now, I'm going to argue that this isn't the right position to, to take, that um, there are all sorts of things that revolutionaries can do in relation to the coming election and in doing so we can draw on a very rich strand in the revolutionary Marxist tr tradition as, as the basis of, of this, uh, this, this approach and I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about that tradition and what it has to offer us. But our starting point has to really be to the, the following, that the, the fundamental basis um, on which we approach the question, not simply of this election, but elections more generally in capitalist society, is in terms of the choice, the fundamental strategic choice, for socialists between revolution versus reform. In other words, we are revolutionary socialists. We don't believe, in other words, that elections can transform society. We don't believe that Parliament is in any sense a real centre of power in our society or in the British state. Parliament today is part of what the 19th century um, bourgeois thinker and to some extent critical thinker, Walter Badgett, called the dignified part of the British state. In other words, it's part of the, de it's one of the decorational, decora sorry, decorative rather than operational parts of the state. You may not think if you actually look at the parliamentarians that it's terribly decorative but it's decorative in the sense of not performing any um, effective function in terms of the running of the state and the exercise of power the real centers of, of power in the state uh, lie with the unelected heads of the civil and military state bureaucracies and of course crucially they lie outside the state itself, in the economy, in the boardrooms, the senior managers' offices, in the multinational corporations, the big investment funds that dominate the financial markets and so on. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, you can, um, uh, Kenneth Clark um, more or less conceded the same point. When he became Chancellor of the Exchequer, he gave a very interesting interview to the Financial Times in which he described what happened on Black Wednesday. Black Wednesday, you remember, is when in September 1992, the pound was forced out of the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system, and the Tory government's poli economic policy was destroyed, essentially by massive, the massive selling of the, the pound on the international finan financial markets. And Kenneth Clark described in the, in the Financial Times um, going to the key government meetings that day, which took place in Admiralty House, which was where John Major was um, set, had running his business or whatever it is at that stage. He wasn't running anything. Um, summoned to Admiralty House to share in the decision to withdraw the pound from the European monetary system. One person commented later that he had been asked to put his hands in the blood 
He, that's to say Clark, was horrified at the way the core of the government's economic strategy had been swept away by the speculators. He told his friends later that the technicians, the treasury mandarins, had taken charge as the politicians stood by powerless. He was appalled when officials demanded that their political masters simply sign on the dotted line. So in other words, there you have a Tory government, not, not even a Labour government, elected government, responsible to Parliament, cabinet government, all, all that stuff, the supposed stuff of the British Constitution, powerless in the face, on the one hand, of the speculators, which, re which are hu essentially massive investment funds and, 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 the, and the like, mobilizing billions upon billions of dollars on the international fun financial markets, them on the one hand, and the permanent bureaucracy of state power, the treasury mandarins on, on the other. That's the reality of how power is exercised in our, in our society. And the whole conclusion of the experience of the working class movement over the past 150 50 years is that there's only one rival source of power to those unelected centers of power, economic and political power in our society, and that's the organized working class. Only the organized working class, particularly when it's mobilized in a revolutionary way, semi-revolutionary way, mass strikes, the formation of factory committees, workers' councils, and the, and the like. Only the working class, when it's fully mobilized, has the power to, to challenge these unelected cent centers of power. And in doing so, it has to take on, it has to challenge, it has to break down the existing structures of the state and re replace them with a new kind of, kind of state, a, worker, a worker's state based upon forms of democracy, consisting above all in the workers' councils, the Soviets as they were called in the Russian revolutions of 1905 and, and 19, 19, 1917, replacing the existing bourgeois or capitalist democracy with a much higher form of democracy. Okay, so that's a fundamental basis for our approach to the question of the e elections. Now, this then poses more sharply the, the question of whether, given that we're revolutionaries, um, sh shouldn't shouldn't we just tr regard par parliamentary elections as irrelevant and essentially go to sleep during election periods? Now that, I think, would be a mistake to begin with because, of course, elections in capitalist society in many ways are extraordinarily superficial processes. The focus on media trivia, uh, the less and less difference there is between the main parties, the more and more it focuses upon personality, style, presentation. So you have, well, I mean, according to some theories, you know, you have Bill Clinton, you know, s winning the presidency of the United States because he's such an attractive pers personality. You have Tony Blair, leader of the Labour Party, because allegedly he's such an attractive personality. There's no accounting for taste is all I can say. Um, the, the way in which we participate in elections is such a passive way. We participate as fragmented, atomized individuals casting our, casting our vote for one or other party that most of us know, even if we're not Marxists, we're, will really misrepresent us in the next few, few years. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very superficial and limited way in which politics goes on during elections. But nevertheless, it does there's more of a focus of people's attention on politics and political questions uh, during elections. Sometimes real issues about how society should be run and how it could be changed do get posed in a very distorted way during elections. And therefore, I think that revolutionaries should always politically intervene in elections. They should always have things to say, arguments to make, points to put about elections. Um, how although the, the way in which they do, do that will depend, obviously, on two things. Firstly, what's actually going on in the election in question, what the choices are, and secondly, also on the resources of the revolutionaries themselves. Okay, granted that, then there are two questions which are then posed very sharp, sharply. First of all, when elections take place, what stance do revolutionaries take up towards reformist parties, social democratic parties like the Labour Party, parties, in other words, that stand for parliamentary socialism, that reflect, uh, sorry, stand at best, I should say, for par parliamentary socialism, because, of course, you know, the S word, the socialism word, word is not something that is uttered at the, uh, in the upper echelon of the Labour Party the, these days. Parties that essentially see winning a majority in Parliament and supposedly on that basis gain, gaining control of the existi existing state as the lever to cha change society. That's the general assumption on which parties like the Labour Party are based. There can be differences about how much change you can achieve through winning, winning an election. P 
people like Tony Benn, Jeremy Corbyn of, obviously stand for much more radical change than is dreamt of, particularly these days, on the right wing of the Labour Party in the circles in which, which are inhabited by people like Tony Bla Blair and Peter Mandelson. But nevertheless, the common assumption is Parliament and elections are the lever for achieving change in society. What stance do revolutionaries take up towards such parties? Secondly, and more specifically still, do, are there circumstances in which revolutionaries should stand candidates themselves in parliamentary elections, even though we don't think elections are the way to change society? Now, here we can learn, in addressing those questions, we can learn an enormous amount from the debates that took place during the early years of the Communist International, the Revolutionary International, the Third International, founded, af founded by Lenin and the Bolsheviks after the success of the Russian Revolution of uh, October 1917, founded to create explicitly a party of world revolution, an international party that would allow revolutionary workers around the world to organize and to fight against the system as one common unified force. During the early years of the Communist International, before it became affected and corrupted by the triumph of Stalinism in Russia its, itself, uh, in the uh, to, uh, in the period crucially, above all, in the early 1920s. They're very important debates that went on from which we as revolutionaries can learn an enormous amount in terms of an understanding of revolutionary strategy and tactics. And in particular, around the second Congress of the Comintern in 1920, there was a very important debate about the relationship between revolutionaries and parliament and elections. Lenin's uh, little pamphlet, short book, uh, Left-Wing Communism, was an intervention in, in these debates. And it contains material ideas, arguments, which are of enormous value to us because what they essentially represented was an attempt by Lenin to generalize from the experience of the Bolsheviks between 1903 and 1917, all the tactical twists and turns, all the different periods of work organizing in different ways that they'd gone through in order to build a mass revolutionary party that could lead a successful revolution. Lenin sought to generalize from that experience to, and to apply the lessons of the Bolsheviks' experience to the, the case of um, the, more, the more general development of a revolutionary movement, particularly in Western Europe, the countries of advanced capitalism, where they're strong, or well, at least some, much fewer than they are today, capitalist democracies um, in which parliament and elections played an important political role. Now, in his intervention in these debates, Lenin was too concerned to avoid and to combat two kinds of errors into which socialists can be drawn, two errors which seem as if they're absolutely opposed to each other, but which are in fact closely related. And these two errors are op opportunism and ultra-leftism. Okay, opportunism. What is opportunism? Opportunism is essentially the case of socialists who may well use very radical, very revolutionary sounding phrases, but nevertheless who in practice adapt to and become incorporated in the structures of capitalist democracy and are effectively drawn along behind the big reformist organizations. So possibly revolutionary words, but in practice adaptation to bourgeois democracy. And here, the most relevant to our discussions today, the most important form that adaptation takes is electoralism. In other words, coming to see elections as a substitute for the class struggle. Seeing elections rather than the mass struggles of workers and the organizations that they build from below, ultimately the Soviets, the workers' councils, as the way of changing society. So that's one error. The second error is ultra-leftism. And ultra-leftism um, consists essentially in turning revolutionary ideas, which are the, the basis of what we do as revolutionaries, ideas like the critique of reformism, the understanding that socialism can only come by revolutionary um, uh, means, taking those ideas that are fundamentally correct and essential for, for anyone who wants to change society to, to hold, taking those ideas and turning them into a barrier that cuts you off from the rest of the working, working class. In this case, in the case that Lenin was concerned with, um, what ultra-leftism consisted in was the refusal in principle to stand revolutionary candidates for, for parliament and the refusal similarly in principle ever electorally to back reformist parties, ever to call for a vote for the Labour Party and parties like it. Now, if you read Lenin's pamphlet, 
uh, as the very title suggests, left-wing communism, his main target is the ultra-lefts. Um, those are the people he's concerned to argue against. But in the course of those arguments, he says things that are of more general application. So he takes up, for example, the case of the German left communists who say, he takes, uh, who argue against ever participating in the electoral process, either directly through candidates or indirectly through supporting social democratic parties. They say, to justify this, all reversion to parliamentary forms of struggle which have become historically and politically obsolete, must be emphatically rejected. So there's the idea that parliamentarism is historically and politically obsolete. So it's something that revolutionaries must have nothing to do with. Lenin, Lenin's comments on what they say are very interesting. He says, parliamentarism is, of course, politically obsolete to the communists in Germany, but, and that is the whole point, we must not regard what is obsolete to us as something obsolete to a class, to the masses. So in other words, just because revolutionaries understand that you can't change society through elections, doesn't mean that the mass of workers share that understanding. You can't leap from what perhaps a very small group of people, or certainly usually a minority of workers have come to understand, to, to um, draw conclusions for what the mass of workers think. Then he goes on to say, you must not sink to the level of the masses to the level of the backward strata of the class. That is uncontestable. You must tell them the bitter truth. You are duty bound to call their bourgeois democratic prejudices what they are, prejudices. But at the same time, you must soberly follow the actual state of the class consciousness and class and preparedness of the entire class, not only of its communist, uh, its revolutionary vanguard, and of all the working people, not only their, their ad advanced elements. So. It, in other words, you fight parliamentarism, you never make concessions to the idea that elections can change society, but you don't ignore what workers are actually thinking, the actual beliefs that they have in their heads. So what's crucial here is that Lenin's saying we have to start, our aim is to win ultimately the majority of workers, the mass of workers, to the idea of a revolutionary socialist transformation of so so society. And we can't do that um, uh, in, in one step. It takes a number of stages. We have to win initially uh, the support of a minority, perhaps a small minority of workers, to the, to the, to the revolutionary program. But that's, that's what we're trying to, to do. But in doing so, Lenin says, we must start from the actual state of class consciousness and preparedness of those workers. In other words, what workers actually think, as opposed to what we think they ought to think. And in capitalist democracies, both in Lenin's time and in ours, this actual state of consciousness involves for a majority of workers a belief, however cynical, however qualified, however pessimistic, in the electoral process, in elections as the focus of politics in society, and a reliance, again with enormous reservations and doubts, on the reformists as the, the lever for changing society. Now this is where we can see the connection between opportunism and ultra-leftism. Both the opportunists and the ultra-lefts, in practice, despair of winning the mass of workers to revolutionary politics. In other words, um, they despair of changing the existing state of consciousness of workers. The despair takes different forms. In the case of the opportunists, the people who just want to pursue electoral politics, what they do is they essentially adapt to the existing state of work the mass of workers' conscious, consciousness and pursue electoral politics. Workers, they don't cease to believe that workers can be won to revolutionary politics, so they become electoralists. They essentially become reformists, even if they're not prepared openly to admit this. The ultra-left equally despair of changing workers' ideas because they simply counterpose a set of abstract workers to workers, uh, sorry. I wonder what an abstract worker is. <laughs> um, a lecturer, thank you, Pat. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose I laid myself open to that. Um, what the ultra-left does, to try and return to the point I was uh, attempting to make, what, what the ultra-left does is simply to counterpose abstract slogans about revolution, the superiority of workers' councils to parliament and so on and so forth, to the existing consciousness of workers. So that's the basic framework that Lenin provides us. How then does this relate to the first of the two questions I raised, the question of electoral support for reformist parties like Labour? 
And this is a question, this isn't just a question that Lenin discussed, of course, this is a question that poses itself every time there's an election in this country, and which poses itself particularly sharply this, this time, because Blair is obviously so rotten, so disgusting, has taken Labour so far to the right. And so we find, for example, the Fire Brigades Union passing a resolution instructing its executive into inquiring whether they should stop simply using their political fund to support Labour, but should insist on using their political fund only to support socialist candidates, and, and so on. That's, that's a questioning about whether workers should still so support Labour and so on. Very, very significant development in, in lots of ways. In addressing this question, we have to start from the nature of Labour and of other social democratic parties. They are, and here again, Lenin offers a very good formula. He says that Labour and parties like it are capitalist workers' parties. Now, this may seem like a really strange and contradictory formula, but if it's strange and contradictory, that's because social democratic parties like Labour are strange and contradictory entities. They're living contra contradictions. Um, we can see social contradictions embodied in a particular org organisation. So that if we look at Labour and parties like it, they, labor rests on the organized working class, but it seeks to contain that class and it struggles within the structures of capitalist society. And in this process, it's the trade union bureaucracy, the trade union leaders that play a crucial role. People traditionally used to say, labor is the party of the mass of workers. That's not right, because the key link that binds labor to the organized working class is the trade union bureaucracy, the trade union leaders. And the trade union leaders, as a social group, are separate from the mass of workers, from rank and file workers. They have distinct interests of their own, which arise from the way in which they act as intermediaries between labor and capital, seeking, therefore themselves, resting on workers' struggles, but seeking to hold those struggles back from really challenging the bosses, seeking to find compromises between workers and bosses. Think of John Monks's, of the TUC's formula about partnership between management and, and labor and industry and so, so, so on and so, so forth. And it's the role of the trade union bu bureaucracy as the basis of, of labor that then explains the character of reformist politics. A struggle against, a struggle for reforms within the framework of, of capitalism rather than an out and out struggle against the whole system. Now, social democracy, as I've said, is a highly contradictory form for, formation and what revolutionaries have to, to, to do is to operate in a way that seizes on and exploits that, that contradiction. And what Lenin argues is that particularly where the revolutionary organization has only limited support inside the working class, it's crucial to establish a bridge between the, the organization and those workers who represent the, b the best section of the, the class, generally, who support labor. And, that, and the supporting labor electorally, calling for a vote for the return of a, a labor government, Lenin argues, is an essential part of establishing that bridge. Essentially, what, what, he, what he says is, and what, what we continue to say in our political arguments, is that we say to workers who support labor, you're against the Tories, and you're against the bosses, so, so are we. You think that a Labour government will make a difference to the fight against the Tories and the bosses. We don't. We think Labour will simply carry on running the system in just the same way as the, uh, the, to the Tories did, will simply act in ca the bosses' interests. We disagree about that. Okay, let's put our disagreement to the test. Let's push against the Tories and the bosses. Let's get Labour into office and then let's see, see what happens. But it's important to emphasize that the call for the vote for Labour is only a part and a very small part of the process through which we pursue a dialogue with these workers. We seek to draw them towards us. And it's crucial to understand that anything that we say about labor in election, electoral election period will be dominated by our criticisms of labor, our criticisms of reformism, our criticism of the betrayals of the labor leadership, particularly um, in the case of, case of Blair, so that it's within the framework of those criticisms that we th we're then willing to, we say to these workers, let's put the t our differences to the test by seeing what a Labour government will be like in practice. It's part of the process in which we work both with and against workers to our right, with, with them, against the Tories and the bosses, against them in so much as they still look towards the reformists. Now, people say things have changed since Len Lenin's time, Seven, 75 years Years have, have passed. Oh, we've had the experience of all these Labour governments, uh, their betrayals, 
society has, has changed. It's no longer appropriate to talk, ab talk about calling for a vote for the, 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 the Labour Party, whatever was right in, in Lenin's time. But I, th I think that's, that's a mistake because what it fails to... Well, first of all, if we just take the case of Britain today, it's nearly, it'll be nearly 20 years since there was last a la Labour government um, by the time there's an election. So the, the experience of reformist betrayal in office will be... A, long, a relatively long time in the past for many people participating in that election. But more generally, capitalism itself as a system, the experience of capitalist exploitation, continually renews l workers' illusions in reformism as a way of, of changing, changing society. Cliff put it well, very well last night when he said that um, it's lack of power that corrupts absolutely. In other words, if, if you feel lack of confidence in your own ability to transform society, it's very tempting to look towards someone else to do, to do it for you. The reformists offer an easy way out, or what seems like an easy way out. They offer the illusion that if you vote for them, then at least there'll be some partial and limited changes, improvements in, 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 in society. So the, the hopes in reformism are constantly renewed by the experience of capitalist exploitation. Now, there's also the argument that's put forward, for example, by Arthur Scargill, and the Socialist Labour Party, that Labour under Blair is fundamentally different from Labour in the past. It's more like the American Democrats. It's, in other words, it's just a straight capitalist party and so on and so forth. Now, I think that it's understandable that people should say that because the move to the right under Blair is so disgusting, so despicable, the sorts of things they've done. I won't list the things they've done because we all know them very, very well. Um, but it's, it, it rests on a fundamental mistake. We need to look beyond the declarations of the people at the top of the party to the underlying nature of the Labour Party. And if you look at the underlying nature of, of the Labour Party, in terms of its ability to mobilise support in society as a, as a whole, it continues to remain crucially dependent on the tra trade union bureaucracy. Now, this is partially true, straight, straightforwardly from a financial point of view, that Labour is dependent upon the trade union leaders for the bulk of its funds. But more generally, in terms of pushing in society generally, arguing uh, in support of Labour policies, getting people to, to vote for the, the Labour Party and so on, the whole network radiating out from the trade union machine is, uh, is absolutely crucial. And this is reflected in terms of the internal politics of the Labour Party it itself. Blair presents himself as a kind of dictator. You know, I'm the leader, do what I say, back me or sack me, all that stuff. stuff. To, lead, to control the Labour Party is very dependent upon the centre-left inside the shadow cabinet. People like John Prescott and Robin Cook, he couldn't have carried his line on Clause 4 with, without them. They, in turn, are closely linked to the trade union, trade union leaders and help to lock even the existing right-wing leadership into the, um, into, the, into the trade union machine. So Blair, Blair and his cronies, Mandelson and co., no doubt would like to see Labour transformed into an American style Democratic Party. Blair would like to see himself as the British Bill Clinton, God, God help us. But there's a gap between what he'd like to do and the realities of, of Labour and realities that are likely to continue. Now, finally, what about revolutionary standing in Parliament? Here again, the standing candidates for par Parliament. Here again, we have to t t take Lenin as our starting point. Lenin says there are all sorts of different tactics that revolutionaries um, take in order to use in order to win support for their politics. One can be standing parliamentary candidates. It can be a way of putting over a revolutionary propaganda to a wider audience. Revolutionary MPs, if elected, can use parliament as a platform uh, from which to denounce parliament and the whole system of which it's part. I mean, imagine a revolutionary MP in the House of Commons these past few days when the bastards have been voting themselves a 26% pay increase. Think of the impact that just one revolutionary could have in that sort of situation in throw, throwing um, a clear light on the corruption and rottenness of the whole parliamentary system. But there are two crucial points to, um, to uh, keep in mind here, that revolutionaries participate in elections and, if elected in Parliament, on a revolutionary and anti-parliamentary basis. So that Lenin says participation in a bourgeois parliament helps to prove why parliaments deserve to be done away with. It facilitates their successful dissolution and helps to make bourgeois parliamentarism politically obsolete. He himself called the Tsarist Duma, the very limited parliament that existed in Russia after the revolution of 1905, um, 
an accursed pigsty, which is a bit like, you remember, um, well, in, in William Morris's News from Nowhere, he says that in the future communist society, the houses of parliament will be turned into a dung market. Same sort of healthy approach to parliamentary cretinism. Um, secondly, electoral participation is a tactic. In other words, it's something you pursue in specific conditions when it facilitates the growth in the size and influence of the Revolutionary Party. So that in Lenin's case, he was in favor of boycotting the Duma in the elections of 1905 from when the revolutionary wave still seemed to be rising. In 1906, when it was clear that the revolution had been defeated, he was in favor of participation in the, in the Duma. Participating in elections is a, is a tactical issue. Now, and that's true in our own, uh, you know, much less interesting and exciting case than that of the, the Bolsheviks. In the late 1970s, the SWP did stand candidates for parliament very unsuccessfully. We got very few votes, and it was a generally fairly negative experience. That reflected partly the fact that the situation was unfavorable, that the class struggle wasn't as we thought when we started standing candidates rising. Workers weren't moving on the offensive. It was actually the beginning of a massive offensive by the bosses that culminated in the Thatcher years in the, in the 1980s. But it's also true that particularly under the British electoral system, standing, which work against small parties, standing candidates involves devoting considerable resources in order to achieve what in realistically is usually going to be a tiny number of votes. And the effect, the effect of that concentration of resources can have distorting effects of, uh, on our, our work. And that really leads to a crucial point, which is the distinction that has to be drawn between the electoral tactic and electoralism. We, it may be right sometimes for revolutionaries to stand for parliament as a tactic, Electoralism is when contesting elections becomes the main point of political activity. And if you look at the far left that emerged in Western Europe in the 1960s, after 68 and so on, France, Italy, Spain, so, so on and so forth, what you see is a flip-flop from ultra-leftism to opportunism. So that uh, the huge, by our standards, revolutionary organizations in Italy at the beginning of the 1970s, uh, ultra-revolutionary, ultra-left, you know, they won't participate, they're so revolutionary that they won't, won't dirty their hands by participating in the existing trade unions. They set up committees in rivalry with them, th but as, and that reflects uh, a self-confidence, an overconfidence arising from a period when the struggle is very high. Once the struggle receded, once the struggle began to collapse in the mid-1970s, you see these organizations collapsing into electoralism, uh, forming the Electoral Front, Democrazia, Proletaria, and retreating from any I idea of independent working class activity. And there's a more general picture that we can see of the revolutionary left, or ex-revolutionary left elsewhere in Europe, a flip-flop from um, ultra-leftism ultra to electoralism and opportunism. Once you m take that step towards electoralism, you compete on an arena which is unfavorable for socialists. You compete on this arena where politics is superficial, where it's atomized, where people um, participate pa passively as individuals and so on. Whereas for th in the real revolutionary tradition, the focus for activity has to be the struggle. When workers are involved in struggle, when workers go on strike, they become open to socialist ideas, to a real transformation of consciousness because of the confidence they get from participating in struggle in a way in which they never do in an, electro in an electoral period. That's why any strike is immensely more important uh, for socialists than, than any, any, any election. And therefore, why we may be, there may be conditions under which it would be right, I don't think the conditions are present in Britain at the present time, but while undoubtedly Lenin's right, there are conditions under which it's, it's right to contest parliamentary, for revolutionaries to contest, contest par parliamentary elections as part of the struggle against parliament and for a higher form of socialist democracy, there's a fundamental difference, from between, difference between that tactic and electoralism as a, a general approach to, to politics. Very last point I want to make is that actually I think that the present pre-electoral pe election period is a particularly favorable one for us as revolutionaries. Tony Blair as both simultaneously and independently a columnist on the Financial Times and I argued more or less simultaneously published art articles, I don't know who influenced whom, um, has been getting his betrayals in early. In other words, pushing through in opposition the kind of shift to the right that normally takes place when Labour's in office. This is creating tremendous anger, dismay, disillusionment among large numbers of Labour supporters. 
that creates an atmosphere of political uncertainty, ideological debate, which is a fantastic opportunity for revolutionaries to intervene in and build, build our organization. So I think that this isn't a, a period to hibernate. This is a really good period for rev revolutionaries to intervene in, provided we start from the general principles of revolutionary politics and the experience of the revolutionary movement internationally. I think that our criteria for wanting to, to vote Labour is one that we have to connect with, with masses of people because whether we like it or not, everybody's sick up to their ears with Tories. Everybody wants to see back of them. And the you know, only electoral alternative to, to getting shut of them is, is Blair and Labour Party. And that, you, you know, whether we like it or not, that happens to be a fact of life. And therefore, if, if we want to be where masses of people are, wanting to get shut at Tories, we've got to be with them. And we don't have a real alternative in this. We've got to, we've got to vote Labour. And, and another reason, if, if, if there ever ought to be a better reason, I remember watching last... Elect last general election results on TV when everybody thought that Labour were going to win. I can remember seeing Neil Kinnock landing at a Sheffield rally in an helicopter and I would, it was just a sickening sight to see, thinking, what has this man got to offer people, you know, sleeping in Dixon's shop windows watching this? Do you know what I mean? Is that absolutely offering? No. But watching as, as, t as night went on and seeing what we thought were going to be a Labour victory, actually Labour get slaughtered, it was absolutely sickening. And I don't think all these people that say, you know, don't vote Labour, we'll stand on as principles and everything, they must be just as sickened as everybody else. And next day when you had to go to work, every single person had their chins on the floor, it weren't passing sandwiches around, it were more like pass razor blades around. People were absolutely sickened by it. And that's, that is where we have to be. We have to be where the majority of people are. And in terms of saying that, let, you know, masses of people do have illusions in Labour. You know, we know that Labour's not going to deliver anything, but for masses of people, they look to see that Labour's delivered health service, Labour's delivered, you know, rating system, etc., etc. There's, there's arguments about that. But, you know, it minds of millions of people. That's what people see when they see Labour. And there's only one way that we're never going to, you know, they're never going to think any different. And that's when Labour's back in and, and, and they actually betray all them hopes and faith that people have. But even, even when all them hopes, are, hopes and faith are betrayed, it all goes dark drain if they're, if they're in an organisation what people can come to, what people can link arms together and take on system. That's what's got to be different about next time after this Labour victory. I want to be on, on Labour now. I want to be pop, pop, popping champagne corks along with everybody else. And I mean champagne because we want to be drinking champagne after this shower's got out. But I tell you, next day we've got to start building resistance against Blair. Of course, comrades, it's absolutely orthodox and absolutely clear that any revolutionary organisation must be built fundamentally out of the struggles of the working class. But elections are crucial events, political events, in bourgeois society, and frankly, we live in a bourgeois society. And in my view, although the presentation which comrade uh, Alex made is absolutely orthodox, in terms of elections being a purely tactical question, I have to say, comrades, number one, it's far too often posed that elections are in some way counterposed to workers' struggles or intervening or basing yourselves on workers' struggles. But secondly, concretely, practically, it's just a question of analysis and judgment, not a question of principle. I think you've got it wrong and you should be piece of disinterested advice to the SWP from militant Labour, I think you should, comrades, intervene in elections now. Why? It's clear, of course, there are hopes, I don't think they're very strong hopes, but there are hopes in sections of the working class that Blair will at least do something that is better than the Tories. But there is already a big uh, uh, section of the working class, different surveys have shown that Maybe 5 to 10% of workers consider themselves basically to be to the left of la Labour that you can appeal to 
you can get a vote from, you can enter into a dialogue with by intervening in elections. It's not counterposed. It doesn't distort your organization necessarily. You can let it. If you decide to become an electoralist organization, you can. It can happen, but it doesn't necessarily happen. And I don't know why you don't intervene in elections. For example, militant labor, like the whole of the far left in Britain, is a very small organization. But we've stood now in something like 90 elections. In those 90 elections, we've got, on average, 8 to 9% of the vote. Now, this shows to me, that's not because we're wonderful, because it's because something is going on out there. To get an average of 8 or 9% of the vote, this is ridiculous. Uh, 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 by any standards of normality. It means that Labour's move to the right creates the audience for building a big mass socialist party, on the one hand, it's also an audience that you can get into a dialogue uh, with uh, through elections. And sometimes you can do, in special circumstances, even get bigger and more substantial things. For example, 10,000 votes for Dave Nellis in Coventry Southeast. For example, 12,000 votes in the Euro elections in Glasgow for Tommy Sheridan. Now, was that worth doing? From our point of view, I tell you, comrades, it was worth doing. We built our organization, we recruited, we helped to focus and strengthen socialist organization and socialist consciousness. I think you're cutting off your nose to spite your face by not intervening in elections in that way. Can you wind and, up, please, come on. Right. And the final point, somebody from the audience has asked the question, well, what attitude will you take in a general election towards candidates for the SLP? What attitude, comrades, will you take in Glasgow towards Tommy Sheridan? What attitude will you take uh, uh, in Coventry towards Dave Nellis? I would hope, I would appeal to you, that you would call for a vote for the candidates of the SLP and militant Labour during the general election. Okay, thanks. Do you... Yeah, I think I just wanted to address some of the, some of the points that the comrade from militant raised, because I think, you know, when he talks about, you know, Tommy Sheridan getting 12,000 votes for the European Parliament, for Dave Nellis getting 10,000 votes. You know, it can sound quite impressive, but actually I think the record of militant Labour standing in elections is actually quite poor. You know, I'm f from Glasgow, and actually they've got less councillors in Glasgow now than they had a year ago, and there's only actually one left, and that's Tommy Sheridan. And what are the prospects for it getting better? Well, if you look at where the electoral success actually came from, then you have to say that actually it's not going to get that much better for them. No, the electoral success that the militant got was, was on the back of the poll tax struggles, a very high level of struggle. That's where the electoral success came from. And actually, the level of struggle since then has gone down. There is a growing debate. You know, people are much more ideological now. People are looking for an alternative. But actually, they're also looking for something that will get rid of the, the Tory government. And that's the Labour Party. And if you're going to take on the Labour Party on an electoral ground, you need to be a much stronger organisation. And actually, I think it's a mistake for, 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 for the militant. I don't know whether, how much truth there is in, but I've heard that, that it, under the, in the, they're, they're involved in an organisation called the Scottish Socialist Alliance, and I understand they're going to be standing 10 candidates in Glasgow, and I think that's a mistake for their organisation. I think it will do a tremendous amount of damage to their organisation. There was two points I wanted to make. One is about the question of ultra-leftism that's already come up, because I think... Um, that the people who, you know, we all know in our workplaces perhaps, or we all know around the movement, who say that really people don't believe in Blair anymore, really people can see straight through the Labour Party, they know how awful they are, would be the very same people who, if the Tories were re-elected, would be saying that the working class is finished, that they all read the sun, that they're all kind of duped by ruling class ideas and so on. And what, it's, what that ultra left in is, is based on is a real lack of understanding of where reformism comes from. Because reform isn't, isn't just something created by, you know, the newspapers or, you know, forced on people by the trade union leaders in the Labour Party. It is something that fits with people's experience of the division of labour at the point of production, of having specialists to do different sorts of jobs, of having a division between politics and economics. People can be conditioned to looking for somebody to deliver on the economic front, somebody to deliver on the political front. 
And even I think where people do begin to fight back in a mass way, people can have all sorts of contradictory ideas of wanting real radical solutions, but on the other hand, reaching for the most normal thing, the thing that you know, is the habit, the, the, the habit of centuries, of wanting somebody there to do it for you, of going back to the methods of elections, of, of electing leaders to do it on your behalf and so on. And I think to, you know, if we understand reformism in that way, then our job is not to cut ourselves off from the mass of the working class, but to find bridges through it, through concrete activity around issues combined with really hard revolutionary politics but also just on the question of standing candidates that for us standing candidates in elections is a weapon we can use in our armory it's not an alternative to building in terms of the working class struggle but where the Bolsheviks did it Lenin made it absolutely clear that the members of Parliament were the least important part of their party by far the most important people were the people in the factories the worker militants the people who could build the class struggle at the point of production the MPs were the trumpeters of the movement they were the kind of icing on the cake they weren't central to it and even, un even under those circumstances, the uh, deputies they did have in the Duma were people who saw their role as building struggle outside of Parliament, always seeing it as can they raise issues, how can they... Um raised the combativity of the class, and Badeyev, who was one of them, said he thought it was a great testimony of his success if outside his surgery were cues and cues and cues of workers who'd been involved in disputes, workers being victimised, workers who wanted to raise issues. Always it was the uh, class struggle that was the most important thing. But I think our ability to use Parliament under circumstances where the party is much, much bigger, the class struggle is much, much higher, will always depend on us having a sizable revolutionary party which has workers, militants in every factory, every college, and so on. And that's the precondition of being able to use that weapon possibly properly is have we got a real revolutionary party which is based on not only using parliament but actually building to overthrow parliament to bring in workers and council soviets that unite economics and politics that give the working class real power in society thanks but alex quoted lenin in 1920 in the second congress he said the labor party is a capitalist workers party the representative of the British Communist Party, William McLean, said the Labour, the, Communist, the Labour Party is a workers' party. And then he said, no, 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 it is a capitalist workers' party. Now, what, it is a contradiction, by the way. The, why he called it a workers' party? Not because the majority of workers voted for Labour. At that time, the Tories got more Labour votes, workers vote than Labour Party. That's not the reason why it is a Labour Party, a workers' party. It is a capitalist party because they remain in the framework of capitalism. They are not breaking with the politics of capitalism. Why the workers' party? Because they express the collective anger against capitalism. Now, you say it is contradiction, but the contradiction exists in life. I mean, you have to watch a Tory conference and a Labour Party conference on television. At the Tory conference, where, first of all, you find the platform is to the left of the delegates or representatives. In the Labour Party conference, by and large, the, deleg the delegates are far to the left of the platform. At the Tory conference, the applause comes when they speak about hanging, birching, uh, kicking immigrants, uh, etc., etc. At the Labour Party conference, the applause comes when they speak about housing, jobs, etc., etc., etc. And if you don't know the difference, there's a very simple thing. I know in the 1987 election, in my state, Honey, my partners, went to every house that there's a notice, vote Labour, right? and she sold socialist worker. We are still having seven people in the street that buy socialist worker. There were a number of notices that say vote conservative. Perhaps she made a mistake. She should have gone to conservative. Perhaps they would have been a better bloody supporters. There is a bloody radical difference. And however much I hate Harriet Harman, I'll tell you straight, every time when I see Anne Widdecom, I fall in love with Harriet Harman. <laughs> I think she's the daughter of Karl Marx, the sister of Rosa Luxemburg. Now you see, now let's be cl absolutely clear about it. Unless you belong to the anti-Tory camp, stop talking about bloody rubbish or fighting, criticizing the Labour leaders. In Tau Hamlet, you know, remember who was the, the Nazi councillor? Derek Beacon. We worked fantastically hard against Derek Beacon, and we were extremely happy to get rid of him. Now I remember by accident, I was, on the same night I was of the election, I was in Bath. In Bath, we had a delegate in the, Labour, in the SWP conference a few months before, he said, who cares about the bloody elections? We don't care about elections. Why should we vote Labour? So I said to him, John, you know, tonight I'm going to stay until 2 o'clock in the morning. I want to know who won the elections 
in Tower Hamlet, in the Isle of Dogs. You probably will go to bed. He said, no, 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 I also wait until 2 o'clock in the morning. And you ask yourself, who the bloody hell replaced Derek Bacon? Was it an SWP candidate? No, it was a Labour Party candidate. We worked fantastically hard to bloody get rid of Derek Bacon. And if people say there is only one bloody inch difference, I don't give a damn. If you fought, don't fight for the inch, you don't tell me about a mile. I mean, anybody in the workplace that when the foreman goes around, he kowtows to the foreman, etc. When he passes, you show to the friend, look what I'm reading, the Communist Manifesto. I'm not bloody impressed. If you don't bloody kick the Tories hard and hard in their face, don't tell me about independent socialist candidate, etc., etc., etc. And the last point is this. In all those things, we have to tell the workers the truth. The Bolshevik party in 1912, they had six members of parliament in the Tsarist Duma. The workers were entitled only to 13 seats. The nobility were entitled to 300. Anyhow, the workers, the Bolsheviks had six out of the 13. Petrograd, Moscow, represented by Bolsheviks. And you know what Lenin said about them? And Judy already quoted it. You know, I'm sorry she quoted it uh, because I, I planned it for two hours to quote it. <laughs> you know what Lenin said about those six MPs? He says, the least important unit of the Bolshevik party, they are the trumpeters. The important thing are the fighters. If we look to par parliament as a platform, I'll tell you straight, to put it in simple English, as a dung heap, you stand on the dung heap, you don't kiss it. The, the thing that probably made me a radical to begin with was the question of racism. Um, I was brought up in what's now Zimbabwe, or what was then Rhodesia, the, which was then in the 50s and 60s, when I was young, boy, very extremely racist uh, society dominated by a handful of white settlers, and it was revulsion against that that really brought me into politics in the first place. And the, the struggle against racism and against its most extreme forms of fascism um, have, have been a very strong motivating force uh, for me always. And so to look at, look at our society today, to see um, the way in which black people are, are, are treated, to see the kind of asylum legislation that the Tories have brought in and are continuing to, to introduce, the appalling way that refugees are, are, tr are treated, the continual racial harassment of black people by the police and so on. Those are things, among many, many, many others, that make me very angry. When did you join the party yourself? I joined in 1971. What uh, led you to join? Well, at the time I was a student at, at Oxford University. It was a time when, um, you know, it was just after the 60s, 68, the great student and worker struggles in, in France and it seemed to me that I was living at a time when it seemed to me that Marxist ideas were, weren't simply dead concepts in books but could be a living reality as shown by 68, as shown by the sorts of struggles that were going on in Britain then against the Tory government of the day, the great miners' strikes of 72 and 74 for, it, for example and I, I wanted to be part of, part of that struggle. We distinguished ourselves from the rest of the left in seeing the Soviet Union and societies like it as simply representing a particular form of capitalism in which the, the party state bureaucracy, the nomenclatura, controlled the economy in really, really essentially the same way as mainly private capitalist firms do the economy in countries like Britain. That meant that we thought that the Soviet Union had nothing to do with socialism. And that meant that when the Soviet Union collapsed, when there were the revolutions in Eastern Europe and the Berlin Wall broke open and so on and so forth, we didn't feel at all defensive about those events. We were very pleased to see those regimes go. We didn't feel that socialism was at all threatened. Informing our politics is Marx's basic idea of the self-emancipation of the working class. And in other words, that socialism is about workers freeing themselves. Um, and what, what that's meant, among other things, is that um, we've always tried to make our politics practically relevant to the immediate concerns and, and worries and fears and, str and struggles of ordinary working class people. What socialism means to me is ordinary working class people uh, taking control of their lives. We live in, a, live in a, not simply a society here in Britain, but in a world in which people are systematically excluded 
from any real control over all the different aspects of their, their existence. And socialism for me is essentially about reversing that.